Monday night, Houston PBS aired Roads to Memphis on the American Experience, a look at the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Tonight, we'll look at the works and legacy of Dr. King and how his impact is continuing to be felt today. I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Houston 8. Joining us tonight are Dr. Tyrone Tillery, professor and author who specializes in African American and civil rights history with the University of Houston. Ovi Duncantel, founder and executive director, Black Heritage Society. And Dr. Virgil Wood, pastor, educator, and civil rights activist who served with Dr. King as a member of his national executive board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Welcome to all of you gentlemen for being here. Pleasure. I think the best place to start is pretty much where the documentary ended by talking about it's not as important who killed Dr. King, but what killed Dr. King. And I think in simply posing that question brings in his legacy and the works he was doing at the time. And I'd like to start with you, Dr. Wood. Yes, I'd like to uh, say that my sense is that Martin Luther King was not a victim of killing. Um, he knew that uh, he he knew in sixty four as early as sixty four that his life would be required, and so in a sense I would say he gave his life rather than somebody taking it. But the point for me is that his legacy started the day he left us. So the question is, what have we done with what he gave us and what we shared with him? And I think that the more we can be critical in our analysis of that we'll find out how we can make our commitment to go forward with where he brought us. He brought us to the point of knowing that we have to solve the economic predicament uh, mm -hmm. of people in our nation. Uh, you know, the majority of our people in America are really poor. Even middle class is really poor today. and People know that. And I think he gave us some formula that can help us uh, fix what's broke. Dr. Tilly, help me understand the world at the time that it happened. How could something like this have happened at that moment? Well, if you look at the history, uh, I think it's easy because by 1969, there was, I'm sorry, by 1965, or as early as that, the belief that uh, the liberal coalition would be the answer to the social, economic, uh, and educational and, and, and problems of African Americans. By 1966, there were many, many African Americans, particularly in the North, who did not believe that this coalition with whites would, would bring any institutional changes that affected their life. In fact, many blacks began to believe that, and it, it, not to disparage Dr. King, but many began to question whether his philosophy would result in any institutional changes that would benefit their life. You had such things, people were beginning to talk about decolonization, uh, black nationalism. Uh, they begin to see themselves as permanent caste, uh, uh, members of a permanent caste, that this country was not interested in making real change. And as a result, there was also, at the same time, you had this happening. You had... Uh, within the liberal coalition, they were beginning to question even their own friends, uh, uh, black liberals and, and, and white liberals. That was, and then you had, oh, and this is what most people don't really give enough credit to, that was never a time during Dr. King's life or the life of any civil rights worker going back to the 40s in which white people were not just as doggedly determined to make sure that we did not have this uh, 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 open society, this, this society based on egalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Let me ask Mr. Duncan Tell. After <clears throat> the assassination, did the movement get pushed back? What gave it the strength to continue on? Well, first of all, you have to look at this entire thing from the street perspective and uh, what was happening in our own streets at the time. Dr. King did a tremendous uh, awakening to our people in terms of uh, getting them to see the evils that was being perpetrated on us. He also started giving us guidelines on how to deal with it. I think the Montgomery bus boycott and various other 
uh, activities that he participated in showed success. However, to the street brothers and sisters out there that was getting their heads beat in every day and having drugs planted on them, and I, I know these things happened because I was out there with them, uh, they start looking toward Malcolm and looking uh, toward uh, a, a, a more aggressive uh, leadership than Dr. King was providing at that time. However, <clears throat> what Dr. King was providing was the same leadership, but uh, there's no question we needed all of these pieces to, uh, 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 to matriculate and come together uh, to survive. Uh, Dr. King, was, if you had to look at it in a militaristic uh, sense, of view, Dr. King would have been the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, Malcolm was the... Uh, was the Marines, and, uh, you know, it, let, let's go in there, let's get it, and let's root them out, and let's take care of this problem. You bring up a couple of really interesting points in that, and anybody that wants to answer on it, could anything have changed if any one of these individuals were involved, or did it take, as he said, the Air Force, the Navy, did it take all of them at the same time coming together to make change start to happen? You, Ma Malcolm and Martin were, in a sense, uh, two sides of the same coin. And if you see this wonderful picture, the one time they met, they're, they're shaking hands. They are literally grinning at each other. You see that picture. They're so delighted in each other's presence. But Malcolm, I think, and Andy Young said it well, that when America uh, killed Malcolm, they set themselves up for the riots. Malcolm was the one person who could have spoken the language. He and Martin were really coming together in their understanding. Martin was a little too, um, uh, um, I don't want to use the Pollyannish, uh, soft on the racism piece, and not really, but that's what, and Malcolm was harsh on it, and Malcolm mm -hmm. reversed. Martin became more strident, so that his last speech at Memphis was a Malcolm speech. You know, his, his speech at Memphis was a Malcolm speech. So I think it took both of them. Now, we have to understand yes. that, that, that the, uh, the, the energies out of those two legacies coalesce mm -hmm. uh, and, and when we go forward. Yeah, I think the key contribution to Dr. King was that Dr. King was this vital center. Mm -hmm. And he was the only person that could, that could speak, that, that could make whites understand the depth of despair, mm -hmm. how much blacks mm -hmm. wanted to be a part of the society, but on equal terms. He was able to take that from the African-American community and, uh, uh, and, and, and get whites to understand that without making whites feel guilty. Mm -hmm. And that was his, I think that was his strength. On the other hand, I'm not sure that, that Dr. King or anybody could have changed what happened after 1965 because so much of it did not take place in the South that was unraveling, but took place in the northern cities. It was, for instance, after the Philadelphia riot, uh, Ramsey Clark, uh, uh, President Johnson's Ramsey Clark said, I didn't know there was a civil rights problem in the North. Mm -hmm. I mean, which was an incredibly naive statement to make. The truth of it is, by 1968, after the Detroit riot, the Commissional Community, uh, Community Relations made this profound comment that says, if there's going to be real social progress, you have to have enough people who are willing to understand that has to be changed. And in truth, there weren't a lot of people who were willing to make more than symbolic mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. The change that, uh, uh, that Virgil talked about in 1985, he said that, Poverty, that structural poverty, and that was you talked about that in, in, in Boston, that structural poverty, poverty was still the unfinished agenda of the civil rights movement. That's what whites were not willing to do. I mean, mm -hmm. even today, we're beginning to see people for their own reasons beginning to question whether or not what blacks have achieved over the last 25 years uh, have achieved it fairly, or is it again we're going back to this notion of affirmative action? And I'm talking about, you know, uh, Donald Trump's comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, a comment that I think is insulting, uh, that he has criticized the president of the United States. He, 
I, I don't recall any white president ever being asked for his birth certificate. That includes John McCain, who was running and who was born in Panama. I don't recall anybody ever asking to see uh, any white president's uh, transcripts. Uh, I think that there is still, after all the progress we've made, there is still an underlying Resi residue of racism in this country that I think black people who have, I think have been quiet mm -hmm. need to speak out more forcefully about. If Dr. King were alive today, would he feel that his work has been achieved? Would he feel what he set out to do had been accomplished? Or would he feel that they still have not reached he it? Would not, no, he, he would know that it hadn't been accomplished. Even when he with lifted, President yeah. Obama and yeah, yeah, yeah. those kind of strides? Because in a sense, uh, uh, um, you know, like Roosevelt uh, said to uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, you know, I agree with what you want me to do, uh, but you've got to make me do it. You've got to create the platform and the energy that makes me do it. Same with Obama. Uh, I think that um, he cannot fix this for us. There has to be um, um, an energy out here among the people that sets the tone and the strategies to which the government has to respond. Now, I think that Martin uh, would be very disappointed that, um, that we have allowed one segment has done well, the black middle class, and Eugene Robinson uh, details this in his latest book on disintegration, that the group he on the black mainstream has done okay, but the black abandoned, uh, have been abandoned, not only by white society, but to a large degree by institutions in the black community as yeah. well. But I think it would also, you know, King, I think King would have had mixed feelings. On the one mm -hmm. hand, you can't deny that there has been major fun, major changes in this mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he, he, he would not be one to shy away from those things that have not come far enough. And, and, and I also think at the same time, King was a, uh, was a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. He understood that this was not going to happen overnight. So while he may, have been, he may be disappointed if he were alive today, he would still, mm -hmm. uh, he would still have the same enthusiasm to, to, to see this journey to its end. That was the one thing about him. He was, he was, he was profound. He was, an, he was an idealist leader, but he was also very pragmatic. I want to hold me right here yes. go down to Mr. Dunn to tell you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, I want, uh, in an agreement, uh, I would like to state that uh, we need to get back to that original uh, question that was asked, what got Dr. King killed? And to be specific, we now know it was the Vietnam, his position. Um, he t he, that he took on the Vietnam War. As long as he was talking about integrating things and integrating lunch counters and those things, there were fuss put up, you know, to say, hey, you can't do that. But it was when he took a definite stand that this war is wrong. It's murdering millions of young people who will never have a chance at life for no good reason at all. See, the Vietnam War was... to catch people up, too. It was a year to the date, actually, of his assassination you know, before the that Riverside, he had done this speech, speech in which right. he criticized our involvement yeah. in Vietnam. And yeah. they started laying the ground... That started laying the groundworks for his, uh, his well, assassination. I, I, I would be a little cautious on that. I think... That you have to also what killed Abraham Lincoln, for example, or what mm -hmm. killed John Kennedy? I think it's the same thing. Uh, I agree with Mr. Duncatel that the war, I think that, that, that that's, that's part of it. But I, 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 for me, that, that's a little too simplistic. Um, because what killed his mama? For and example, you, were, you were saying that... Yes, I'll let you... King, Martin's mother, Mrs. Alberta Williams King, was murdered playing the Lord's Prayer in church on Sunday morning at Ebenezer. Um, I think that we don't know the who-ness of these things. I'm suspicious. Andy Young is suspicious. Um, many people feel our government's been involved. I think so. But that's, that gets us on a side road, I think. Mm -hmm. What we have to figure now is what do we do with Martin Luther King's legacy that makes things better for our people, for people, for society, for nations? That's where I'd like to see, I'd like to see that kind of discussion go forward across the country. Yeah. I think there was, there was this this great fear of change. Uh, I think whites were terrified at the 
civil rights movement in general, mm -hmm. at the insistence uh, on the part of blacks that they would not be denied mm -hmm. uh, first class citizenship, that which meant housing, which meant the improvement in police community relations that that police somehow had always thought that policing the black community was some sort of anomaly. They could do anything they wanted in the black community, that they wanted better schools which meant that uh, they, they feared in the integration. The book that I just did, that there was no greater fear on whites during the 60s than the thought of having blacks move into the neighborhood. So it was this fear of change. And I think we see some of that today uh, as it is directed now toward uh, brown people, toward mm -hmm. people of, mm -hmm. of, of Hispanic heritage. But what will happen to... It is funny to me when I hear you talk about, and we've been doing a lot on this topic this month here on Houston 8 and on Channel 8, and the part that I keep seeing, and I watch it, and I know this happened, but seeing these films that we've been showing, seeing this information, I am shocked that we lived in a world where some people were put aside. and were, But then when you say it happens again, we see these things repeating with different minority groups as we move through, it fascinates me. And I think looking back at the civil rights movement of the 60s, we can better understand where we are even today and how we treat people and what we can learn from looking mm -hmm. back on mm -hmm. this. It just, it's very disturbing, but important to know. If we, if we are honest, I mean, Frederick Douglass said that, you know, that Truth is both is both necessary and proper at all times and in all places. I think today the problem is that there are people who want to rewrite history mm -hmm. because they're uncomfortable with the kind of things that we're talking about now. We see this perhaps even in the Texas uh, uh, the, the the Texas curriculum changes. We can see it all over the place. We 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 have people trying to re reinvent the white citizens councils. You know. So this has to be addressed. I mean, you can't move forward unless you are strong enough. King always talked about that people who are fearful never move forward. I think part of it, though, is, is King was trying at the end to bring the, the Appalachian poor, the white poor out of Appalachia, the uh, Hispanics out of the barrios, because he realized that, uh, you're right, Dr. Taylor, that folks felt that, okay, these black people are going ahead of us, and we, we're left back here. And, and, and King was addressing the issue that we've got to make this thing work for the nation mm -hmm. as a whole and for mm -hmm. all the people. Uh, and, and right now, people are, are mystified as to why uh, there's a large segment of our population who continue to vote against their own economic interests. Mm -hmm. and I'm talking about the, the average Joe six-pack or whatever. And I think it's because we have not quite made that connection yet. It's and the, that's still out there for us. It's the great paradox of How history. do we rise together? How do we right. rise together? And I think we do do a disservice also often when we lump Dr. King's work in with African-American community and stop uh, there. Alone. Because that's when right. you talk about he was there for, his whole yeah. argument was all people right. equal, not certain people We, we as a people. Up. We yeah. as a people. And, and our, in order to keep expressing that, we also must keep control of his legacy. This is another fight that's going on out there. It's insidious, but it's there where right now, even in this city, uh, there's a fight on as to who's going to uh, keep Dr. King's memory alive on the holiday. Well, we started this in 1983, uh, 78 with Dr. King's father, Daddy King, was our first grand marshal here. We had a parade, we had a street change. And that, those were just the basic elements uh, established to set the ground. And I know with. that's an issue that you and your organization are dealing with on all that. And, and, and I would say from where we sit, I think any celebration of Dr. King and his work, and that Dr. King does belong uh, to all of us. But, but one of the things we're trying to make clear is mm -hmm. that we don't want to see changes, reconstructive changes start happening to Dr. King's image. And that's what we want the image to be what it is. And uh, that's what we fight to preserve, and uh, we understand and know that nationwide, it's not just happening in Houston, nationwide there are others who say they want, who want to tamper with the, the legacy. Could, could I just say a word yes, about sure. that? You know, the forthcoming dedication of the National Memorial in Washington, and I think M Mr. Dunkatel and his colleagues deserve an awful lot of credit for the work they've done across the years. But let me say this, the King legacy doesn't belong to any of us. It came belongs to the ages, and uh, we can't put him in a bottle. We can't put him in a box. I don't care if we're the family. I don't care who we are. 
Now, when we dedicate the memorial to King in Washington on August the 28th, 43 years ago when he made that speech there, right, uh, we will be acknowledging something. Here's what I think of us. We have put his name on a whole lot of stuff all over America. Most of it is dilapidated, run down, and all the rest because we did not have the commitment to do what he was doing. We was, we were more interested in 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 in, in buying into and in, in kind of sapping up his credit, his almost his celebrity status. We've tried to we've made him into a hero, a cult leader. He's not that. Martin Luther King was the first among equals of some very extraordinary people. I want to call three names of which King is one. One is Sam Proctor. One is Leon Sullivan. And when you see the, the progress that black America made during that period, you've got to talk about those three to understand King. You cannot understand King apart from Proctor, apart from Sullivan. But mainstream America uh, uh, barely knows those names, right. and it's sad. That's right. I, I agree. I think the King, uh, King belongs to all of us. Uh, I think there has been uh, a tendency, like most things in America, to commercialize mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the people. But I think there's still the essence of King. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, don't, I don't think somehow we've lost the real essence of King. I think we understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that, you know, uh, I think we still, th th there's still the, this unfinished agenda that we have to, that we have to complete for for King's dream to be completely realized. But uh, I think King is still a wonderful symbol. But I also think that in, the, in, in recent years, as he points out, there are other, we, we've come to appreciate other symbols of the struggle uh, uh, of, of the 50s and 60s uh, as well. You know, and, mm -hmm. and for a while there was some resentment of, of King as the symbol because there were many in the North who felt that this was this was legitimate society's the, the decision to make him the uh, uh, the symbol of the civil rights movement. And, and time has passed, and that's changed. We now we embrace W. E. B. Du Bois way that we couldn't then, and 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 and, and we even we have kind things to say about Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. So I think now that when we think about the struggle, and it is a it is it cuts across class. It, it's a, a excellent point. It cuts across class. It cuts across across color. This is why we, when we look out at young people today, we don't see the young people that we saw when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. There are still things that have to be done. And we have to, and, and it may be some inconvenient truths that we have to still mm -hmm. deal with, mm -hmm. but we have to. I do want to step back before we run out of time, and I want to bring up the fact of the book that you wrote yes. and about the lessons that you learned from Martin Luther King. And yes. I think that is a, a wonderful place to start to bring this conversation to a close is wonderful. what you learned yes. and what you can share with us. Yes. I, 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 I was res I've wrestled. I had my 80th birthday two weeks ago. Well, happy birthday. Uh, thank you. And I've been in the struggle since I was 17. So it's been a long period of things to think about. I believe at the heart of what King represented was the confidence that building society based on love, systematically, completely. He called it the beloved community. I wrote this book in Love We Trust, Lessons I Learned from Martin Luther King. And I've collaborated with many of our colleagues who also work with Dr. King, and we, we agree that if we can, if we can get the, the attention of, of, of our thinkers and our activists and all the rest to, to, to look at the legacy. Look at the legacy of King and also look at the forces that made King. Not, not make King into a source of religion or anything, but look at the forces that created a King. How do we, how do we now create more people like a King, or people who can take responsibility for their own lives mm -hmm. and for their communities and for their nation? If we can raise up young people who can do that. I spend a lot of my time now with young people, young leaders, yeah. young ministers, all the rest. Mr. Dunkel, do you see that on the horizon? Do we have new Martin Luther King Juniors out there? Uh, yes, of course, and I want to definitely agree with uh, the, you know everyone that's sitting here. But I'm, I still must maintain that the legacy of Dr. King is uh, to be preserved, and along with the legacy of Malcolm and the legacy of uh, uh, all of the folk that have proceeded in, in us and made life better in some way for us and made it possible for us to even be sitting here. I am simply saying that 
those things are sacred. And I'm not going to let Donald Trump and other people like that come in and determine and define who Dr. King is. And that's, that's my position, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, encourage anyone else to follow what well, I'm talking about. In the last 20 seconds, I'm going to go to you, Dr. Hillary. Any thoughts in closing for, our, for the end here? Yeah, I think that on, on, on the one hand, uh, I am grateful to, to live at a time where my son has friends of all classes and all colors. But I, I too, am not naive that we still have an undercurrent of racism, but we've made great progress, largely because of King, but also because of the NAACP and other organizations, too, as well. And at that point, we thank you all for being here. Thank you, gentlemen. An honor to speak with you all. And now, each week, we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topic, and even watch past episodes. Now here's a programming note. Last Monday night, in addition to the MLK documentary, Houston PBS aired The Strange Demise of Jim Crow, a look at how many southern cities were desegregated. So next Friday night on Houston 8, we'll look at the impact that Jim Crow had in our area and how we saw those laws come to an end. If you have a question or comment you would like to share with us on that topic, feel free to email us at Houston 8 at HoustonPBS.org. And that does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for watching. Have a good week. Thank you.